All right. Meeting is being recorded. I guess we can see everything. Welcome, everybody, to Queros tutorial for IQAC 2024. I'm very excited for this. I hope I sound excited because I am. We're going to have a great time together for the next uh, couple of days. I hope many of you are interested in trying to take on our challenge, which you hear more about tomorrow morning. But I promise it's going to be a uh, you know, full query experience. That's what we try to bring always to, to this event. So uh, a degree of sophistication. Sophistication means, if you know me, I always say a mix between complexity and elegance. That's what sophistication is, um, at least definition, my definition. Um, and today we are going to start with getting you up to speed with what you will need for running uh, this uh, challenge and trying to, to succeed at it. I see some faces that I already know. So if you have already been through some of these tutorials, all the better. Uh, it's going to be a refresher. But if you have not, this should cover everything you need from the get-go. I have here with me my friend Phil. We are going to be kind of jointly talking this through. And we're going to start with concepts, a little bit of uh, motivation if you did not get from uh, Nate's talk. But we are very excited about neutral atoms. We are excited because uh, they are all equal. They are easy to reproduce because they're all equal. And because they are not ions, because they, we don't torture them and remove their electrons, we leave them with all their parts, their limbs, uh, they are neutral. So we can put many of them together and they don't complain. They are also very interesting for efficient control. We have uh, with very few lines of control for the number of qubits that we have. And in fact, the number of lines does not scale with the number of qubits linearly, right, or, or worse. So this is great. So this means that as we scale up, we don't need to scale the complexity of the systems. Uh, we have all this story of moving atoms around. You're going to get to, if you're doing our challenge, you're going to get to play a little bit with that, uh, at least for initialization of a problem. And this allows for a lot of flexible pro problem encoding, which is exciting. And it's, uh, we believe it is the fastest path to error correction. You may have uh, uh, heard some news from us as of December last year that uh, we start to demonstrate this architecture is capable of doing operations on logical qubits at a quite decent scale even today. So we call this the logical way to think about quantum computing. If it's logical, how can you argue, right? Um, so, OK, let's get going. I'm not going to go through too deeply about what is quantum computing. I hope that uh, uh, you have had already a refresher, at least from Will's talk, on what's the, what quantum computing is all about and how it operates. To run our machines, uh, we will not be operating quantum gates. You're going to be programming, as Nate said, connectivities of the atoms and energetics of those atoms. And uh, nevertheless, they are going to be very quantum, which means that instead of classical bits, we are going to be operating quantum bits. We are going to be operating on probabilistic distributions, and uh, you're going to have to uh, navigate this fact. Uh, and uh, again, the main distinction being that uh, most machines that you have access to today are digital or gate-based. Aquila, the machine that you're going to be playing with, is an analog machine. And the difference is really this picture, right? So an analog machine is as if you had one big quantum gate that operates over all qubits at once, and you control that continuously in time. Digital, you have many individual ones. And you can see that if every qubit, if every gate is noisy, doing many individual noisy gates seems more problematic than doing one big single gate that is, you know, it's a single one. Of course, that it, it's not as simple as that, but it gives you an, a, a, an intuition as to why this is more efficient. And it's more efficient in particular for quantum simulation and time-dependent phenomena where we don't have to trotterize the, the, the protocol. So of course, uh, one is efficient and, univer and not universal, and the other is, not, is universal but not efficient. So uh, making universal analog operations is very hard. We are aiming at making a machine that is capable of doing uh, a wide enough range of uh, of uh, programmability that uh, it uh, overcomes the fact that it's not universally programmable, but yet still remains efficient. So a little quick uh, picture to what I mean by programming uh, and uh, moving atoms and, and uh, using geometry in your favor. If you have never been to Boston, now you have. If you've never seen Boston, now you have. And if you don't know where you are, you are kind of a cro It's true. 
So uh, we were here talking about puffing up atoms. And uh, that's it. So they they grow up and then they become I'm share your screen on Zoom. Share my screen on Zoom. Absolutely. Share this screen here. And hopefully you will not get disconnected again. And there is uh, my friends again. Here we go. Uh, so the state that is up there, the excited one, we, we call a Rydberg state. Rydberg state is just our jargon for any state that has very large principal quantum number. For us, we go from the ground that is a 5s, so n equals 5, principal quantum number equals 5, uh, to 7t s, 70. Seven zero. So very large principal quantum number. A few figures here of uh, the process of uh, operating the machine, but basically what happens is you, the user, are gonna, is going to define where you want the atoms in a given geometry. So we're going to load a little bit, that little thing we call a magneto-optical trap with a bunch of atoms. We're going to pierce it with lasers on the shape of what you ask for. You're going to load that. It's going to be stochastic. So about 60% of them, the atoms go in the right place. Uh, then what we do, we get extra atoms. So you can see on the corners over there, right? The, the reservoir regions. And they are extra atoms that we use to slide them into place for all the atoms that were not where you wanted them. Well, they were not there, but you want them to be there. And then you get something like the, the figure in the center. This figure in the center contains uh, an array that uh, we are being honest with you. Sometimes they have a little mistake, but generally we are at like 99.5 fidelity of uh, filling this for you. <coughs> You do a calculation, you can see here in the time scale, these are milliseconds for most of this, tens of milliseconds. Like the quantum calculation actually uh, happens through a 20 microseconds time, out of which we provide you with four microseconds of coherence. There's The coherence is longer than that. We chop you before so that you don't get frustrated that things are decohering. Um, more on this uh, uh, later. And you get what you're going to get in the end is an image that is going to say 0 or 1 if the atom is excited or not. Mind that zeros and 1s are actually flipped with what you expect. OK, so if the atom is shining, it's in the ground state. We call that 1. And if the atom is excited, it disappears, and we call it 0. But the excited usually is what you expect to be 1. So don't get confused. You, you will get confused. <laughs> um, and you, what you're going to get is not that image. It will be too complicated. You just get a matrix of zeros and ones. You're going to get a matrix from the middle saying, OK, the atoms were in the right place or not. And a, a matrix in the end saying, OK, this is what happened. And this corresponds to a measurement in the Z basis. Nothing like a quick example to showcase at Aquila operating. So if I've never seen this, uh, these are atoms. We are placing them uh, in that geometry over there. In that geometry, I don't know if you can appreciate, but the atoms are kind of far apart. Okay, so they're far apart. They are not interacting. These are all single qubits. For all that you care, they are far from each other. They don't sense each other. So any calculation that I do, uh, they are going to do literally block sphere rotations like you, you learned from Will earlier today. The pulse we are doing here is a two pi pulse. So two pi pulse, the atom is there. It should rotate and come back. And what you see is that it starts blinking, right? Because there's some errors. So when you hear that there is noise in a quantum computer, you're seeing noise here. This, this is what noise means, OK? Statistically, you're seeing statistics happen, quantum statistics happening in front of your eyes. I, I, I love looking at this. If you like looking at this as well, all the better. Challenge is on you. I'm doing another pulse perpendicular to the position, to the direction of the atom. Do you have a guess for what pulse it is? Where are we pushing this arrow? Pi over two. Who said pi over two? Got it right. Amazing. What pi over two would do? What, would you, what, what makes you think it's pi over two, if you can share? Very well. So a pi over two pulse would be something similar to a Hadamard, right? Something that's going to send you to a linear superposition between zero and one, and with equal probabilities, fifty percent each. So, I mean, uh, look at this. It's one one over square root of two zero plus one, right? That's what it means. That is what it means to be one or one over square root of two zero plus one. So fifty percent of them are popping up, fifty percent of them are down. Ish. Right? Noise. Good. So how does it happen? Uh, how do you program Aquila? How are you going to be doing this 
uh, in a bit, you are going to have a play field. Here I'm putting the atoms, the little blue dots here, in a, a, a hexagonal lattice. You don't need to do that. Uh, you, you, users can change that. And uh, so they are always going to be in a plane. No, we are not doing 3D. No one is doing 3D. There's no reason to do 3D. Uh, when we start moving atoms, during calculation, it goes to auto connectivity, so you don't even care. Uh, so for now, everybody's going to be 2D. The little uh, uh, red motifs there, they are the lasers that hold the atoms. So they, they are called laser tweezers. Like laser is not like lightsaber, right? Laser laser has a waist. We call it focal point. It's not straight. It has a waist. And the, this waist is sticky, so you can use it to hold stuff. So biologists like to hold cells. We like to hold rubidium. And uh, and then we shine laser this green field in the plane of the atoms. So this field means that all the atoms are going to be under the same influence of a single field. This is what we are talking about, having that big many-body gate. It's, it's this green field here over everyone. Uh, users are going to control two things. One of them, the geometry. You get to pick where the atoms go. The second, the dynamics. What are the intensities, the phases that these lasers are going to implement on the on the system? Do you need to be an atomic physicist? No, you don't, right? So there, all of this is controlled by your good old Hamiltonian. So this is an energy matrix or energy function, kind of cost function that we use to control quantum dynamics. And you know that quantum dynamics algorithms, right, means you start with a state at some point, you do manipulations, and you get that state to some place where you want it to be in a controlled way. That's what an algorithm is, right? You, you get input, you, get, you give input, you get output, and you control things in the middle of the way. So for a quantum dynamic, for a quantum program, technically, all that you need to know is what's the Hamiltonian and, and how you can control it. If you don't know Hamiltonians, don't be scared. We can talk about later. No, don't don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. It's dangerous to go alone. We are here for you. We're gonna have multiple people here for you. <laughs> so so don't be don't worry. Uh, and yeah, so the the energies here that are gonna control the the, the rates of uh, population here. We're gonna talk more about that right now. So equation. <laughs> uh, the Hamiltonian for our system looks like this, and uh, I'm gonna go term by term. The first term, we call it the Rabi amplitude. So it's a term that is going to allow you from to move from the ground state to the Rydberg state. So this is the guy that leads to quantum superposition, to mixing between states. And uh, uh, in particular, it leads to Rabi oscillations. Therefore, we call it Rabi amplitude. This phi here, this i, by the way, this i is, is labeling the qubit. Don't confuse with that i. That i is the complex number. I refuse to call it j. And, and phi here, we call it a phase because it's a phase. And, and you can control these guys as a function of time. I will tell you how in a bit. But you can see that omega and phi do not depend on the little label i of the, of the atoms. This means that all of them are going to feel the same. So OK, why? Because it's one laser. It's one laser that goes to everyone. And uh, very well. So this guy here, if you are more used to you know, familiarize with uh, gateways quantum computing, this is the guy that corresponds to like uh, generating X gates. You know, so you just get bit flips. And uh, next term, we, this delta here. So this delta, if you're familiar with our notation here, N equals zero in the ground state, one in the Rydberg state. Yes, it's flipped with what you're going to get from the machine. Uh, uh, it is. Um, this guy here is diagonal in the computational base, right? It's zero, zero, one, one. So this is going to play a, a role, like a, a diagonal kind of energy. And this is an energy penalty for every atom that is excited if delta is positive, or it's an energy, what's the opposite of penalty? A benefit. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, in, in, I don't know, uh, like uh, stim stimulus, stimulus. <laughs> uh, if it's uh, negative, because then uh, we compensate that minus factor over there. This guy leads to, uh, you achieve it by changing slightly the energy of these atoms here. This uh, well, is a shift, it's not a random shift, it's uh, not a random shift, this is a start shift. Uh, and because there's a small shift, on the, the the kind of resonance, 
we call it that detuning because it's out of tune, like me playing Irish music. Uh, and then finally, the last but not least important term, which is this interaction term here. This interaction term here, you can see if both atoms are in the ground state, it's zero because zero times zero is zero. This interaction term, if one atom is in the excited state and the other is in the ground state, it's zero because one times zero is zero. If you flip them, zero times one is also zero, so don't get scared. But if both of them are excited, that's what I was saying, right? Now both atoms are large, and then there is some bipolar interaction, and now there's a cost for them to be side by side. And this cost we call Vij. Vij is a constant. You will see me writing C6 for this constant nomenclature, divided by the distance between the two qubits to power six. So it's a power law. It decays very fast. It decays way faster than Coulomb interactions. But when Nate said that you are going to use geometry, and geometry is important because things that are close interact, things that are far don't, this is what we are talking about. Moment for our questions. Yeah, yeah. So the way you control this omega is by controlling the laser intensity. But you don't tell laser intensity do this. You just say, oh, I want this much Rabi amplitude. And then the system will read that of what it has to do with the laser intensity. Yep. Sorry, it must be that I didn't quite follow, but uh, what's the difference between GI and MRI again? G, I, oh, so these are the two states. So think of zero and one. Okay, it's just this, it's this, the ground is the Rydberg, the ground is the G, so that's your zero, and R is your one. Okay. Okay, that's all, yeah. Thank you. No problem. Yep. Oh, this is, this is Hermitian conjugation, right? So every Hamilton has to be Hermitian. Last one? But it's not Coulomb, right? So, so this this interactions they are dipolar, okay? So it turns out that uh, they they going very lightly on the atomic physics here, okay? So we are on n principal quantum number s states. S states they they basically they have no angular momentum, uh, but the coupling is dipolar. So you couple with a a, a position r. That does not couple to another S state because uh, zero plus one cannot be zero. Zero plus one is one. Okay, semi angular momentum. So, what happens is that you get a dipolar interaction that is to second order perturbation theory. The first order is dipolar. So, if you remember dipolars, it goes with one over R to the cube, right? R cube. And if you get second order perturbation theory, you get one over R6. We'll keep moving. Thanks for the questions. So, Let's talk a little bit about the hardware constraints. So we are going to put atoms in a play field. And uh, these are things that you have to be aware of. This play field is real. It exists in physical space. This means that you are going to be programming in your, our programming language. You're, you're programming micrometers and megahertz. OK, it's the only programming language that you program with units. So there is a little error bar on the position of the atoms of order 0.1 micrometers. The play field you get right now is 75 by 76 microns. This means that you can always fit a little bit more in the y direction, and you should. It's a little bit better to elongate things along the y direction. Technical details, we don't need to cover them now. There's a minimal distance between atoms. Don't forget, it's four micrometers. And there is a, a condition that the atoms, they should be positioning rows along the each x direction. So in a given x direction, it can go uniformly. But as soon as you create another atom, you cannot put a, like atoms arbitrarily. If you want to put many atoms in the same row, you can. But then uh, you're kind of losing a row in some sense. And th these rows, they have a minimal distance of 4 micrometers. Uh, uh, We're also working on relaxing that. We can talk about these details. You, you, will, you will go through this, I, I, I promise. <laughs> The dynamics you control by controlling omega, delta, and phi. O omega and delta are piecewise linear. Phi is piecewise constant. You can have a maximum omega of 2.5 uh, 2 pi megahertz. To, yes, uh, 
just, let's just talk about megahertz, okay? But the two, always put the two pi there. It, uh, you, 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 will, you will also understand why it is important. But uh, you have to pick a unit, and we are gonna not use cycles. Let's let's fix off uh, megahertz here. Uh, but on blockade, you have to put the two pi's. Um, the maximum then for omega is gonna be two point five uh, to pi megahertz. Delta can be negative or positive. Go from minus twenty to plus twenty to pi megahertz. Whenever you do a program, omega has to start at zero and finish at zero. Delta does not. And uh, um, there we are going through that. And as I said before, for microseconds, for uh, your uh, coherence, uh, uh, for your, your program. So the technical, technically, the coherence time is between 6 and 8 microseconds. But we chop it early so that you make sure that everything you do is going to be like deep, deep quantum coherence. Questions? OK. What do you do with the interaction piece? So this is where things get started, because this is where logic starts to come into play. So let's imagine we have two atoms, a distance d apart, and we can build the Hilbert space of these guys. So ground, ground, Rydberg, ground, ground, Rydberg, and Rydberg, Rydberg. Those are the four options of excitations for these guys. The, if I put a little delta there, negative to make these things positive, uh, the guys that have one Rydberg excitation has have energy delta above the ground. And the guy that is RR is going to have one delta plus one delta, so two delta, one for each R, plus a V because one times one is one. Remember, N, N I, N, J, right? So if both of them are one, I, I pay V, I, J. I'm just calling it V. Now, this distance is one. This V goes with one over the distance to power six, which means that a moment of uh, tension here Thanks for that. It helps. How emotional is that, right? How emotional is that? So, so as you take the atoms and you bring them together, woo, right? One of the energy levels actually flies away because it gets so energetic. Technically, the scale, the physical scale is very tiny. But okay, for 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 visual purposes, uh, this is better to understand, right? So I push this guy so that they, it's so energetic you cannot reach it. You cannot have enough laser power on your omegas to reach that guy. And then you expel this guy from the Hilbert space. This allows you to do conditional logic. If you have two atoms that are close together and one is excited, the other cannot. One can pick phase, the other cannot. Two qubit gates, blah, blah, blah. Right? So for us, what we're going to do is play with this in a different way. By the way, before I move on, how much close is too close? So there's a, a scale that you can find for that. We call it the blockade radius, and we call it RB. There are many ways of de defining it. But for all your purposes, you can always remember that it's going to be a constant C6 that you can uh, obtain easily from us, divided by a square root of uh, omega square plus delta square, the Rabi and the detuning square. So if uh, omega is 0, then you only have delta. If delta is 0, you only have omega. If both of them are 0, this distance becomes infinite. And uh, nothing is actually happening because there's no dynamics. Um, and uh, all of this to power 1, 6. So one classical problem that whenever you talk to Quera, you're going to be hearing us talk about uh, is this problem of maximum independent set. And this is the problem for Duncan Dunn, as I was telling you before. So it's an NP-complete, NP-hard problem, depends on how you state it. But the idea is that you have a graph here, the white uh, vertices. They're connected by edges. And you're going to paint them, paint them in red. But I'm going to give you a condition. Right? It's not just coloring. You're going to color in a way that uh, if two vertices are connected by an edge, you cannot paint both of them. So if I painted this guy, I cannot paint that guy because they are connected by this edge. But if I paint this guy, I can paint this one because there's no edge between them. So painting one, I can do. Painting two, I can do. Painting the maximum number of them in a given graph is the hard problem. That's what's called the MIS, the maximum independent set. Any, any set of subset of, of uh, vertices that have been painted is an independent set. The maximum is the largest possible. It's that it can be degenerate, okay? There's no not necessarily a unique solution for in a given in a given graph. And for us, the way that you define connectivity, you have just learned that there is an, a blockade radius. Just a second. There's a blockade radius. So anything that is too close, closer than blockade radius, is going to be 
as if they were connected. And if they're far enough, they're disconnected and they can be excited at the same time. Yes, question. Just said, <laughs> right? So it, uh, it, uh, it represents VIJ. Right, to some extent, it's VIJ. So the, the farther these atoms are far apart, the, imagine that this VIJ is decaying, 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 and at, at some scale, it's negligible, for in comparison with the other scales of the problem. So this means that uh, uh, atoms that are, if I define omega, a given omega and a delta, I define an RB, and if I define an RB, I know that everybody that's inside is inside that RB is under the influence of that atom, and therefore is as if they were connected. Those are those are by the way called unit disk graphs, graphs that are connected by a unit disk. Yes. Uh, what's the yellow? It's to describe what would be the, the blockade radius of this blue atom here. Is it correlated with the, the omega and delta? So I'm like, yeah, is it correlated with anything on the graph? That's yes, the edges, right? So let's 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 look carefully at this. Like, look, this guy is is inside the yellow region, right? Now notice that there is a little edge between them. This guy is outside of the yellow region and there's no edge between the blue and that guy. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's what I'm talking about. So atoms that are inside of this disk, they are connected. You can always read, you know, tonight, read a little bit about unit disk graphs and uh, it's gonna be clear what a unit disk graph uh, is, but that's that's it, thanks. Any more? So let's keep moving because I wanna get to programming uh, in a second here with Phil. A quick algorithm for you. If you wanted to do an MIS problem, the simplest possible algorithm that I can think about is an adiabatic algorithm. I start my delta very large and negative. So if delta is very large and negative, all the n's want to be zero because n cost energy. Each of them is gonna cost energy delta. So if I had 10 atoms excited, I would have 10 delta. And we don't like things that are energetic, right? Ground state is always the smallest possible energy. So we start with delta negative, and now you ramp it up, ramp it up, ramp it up. When delta gets very large and positive, suddenly it's very beneficial to have n to be positive, right? Because now I'm going to cost minus 10, or 10 excitations, times delta. But this guy here is not going to allow that to happen. This guy here is going to say that even if you are paying, getting beneficial deltas here, if I put two atoms together, I'm paying V positive. So this guy is going to be responsible for saying that uh, what, for atoms that are too close, I'm not going to actually, actually excite both of them. And uh, for atoms that are far enough, that's okay. I'm, I'm gaining delta energy and basically zero from the other one. So it's all right. Uh, but of course, these things are all diagonal in your Hamiltonian. And if you're comfortable with your Hamiltonian, you remember that a state that is an eigenstate of their system is never going to stop being an eigenstate of your system. You have to connect it to something else. And that's where omega comes to play. Omega comes here and cranks up as large as we can. Uh, this is actually bigger than what Akala can do. Uh, <laughs> you can do it in your simulator or your computer. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and here is where we start to see mixing. You start to see mixing, 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 mixing. So you start raising this guy, raising this guy. This guy comes up, comes up, comes up. And then you had a state that was zero, zero, zero. And now this zero, zero, zero becomes zero, one plus zero, one, zero, 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 all the possible bit combinations. But not all possible bit combinations because some bit, combina bit combinations are going to violate this maximum independent set. And then you keep going, 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 going. And at the end of this calculation, boom, you are, all your kind of superposition and, and the interference is going to select naturally a state that's going to be uh, a maximum independent set. And if you do this fast and you are familiar with the adiabatic theorem, you're going to remember that uh, this is going to be a crappy result. But if you go do, and do this slowly and you're familiar with the adiabatic theorem, you remember that you start in the ground state, you're going to continue in the ground state, and that's going to be the ground state, and your, your ground state is going to be the solution of the MIS problem. There are other protocols that you can do, but this is one simple one. MIS is very interesting, very useful. I'm not going to cover through this, but we have uh, papers uh, talking about uh, possible applications, and uh, uh, applications are going to be part of the, the 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 challenge for tomorrow. So uh, always worthwhile start to wrap your mind a little bit about applications of this type of graph problems. And with that, I'm going to pass the word to Phil, who is going to teach you about blockade with a Q and no U. All right. Thank you so much, Pedro.
Pedro, you're going to want to mute this. Okay. All right, so we don't have a lot of time left, so let's go ahead and get this started. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you so much, Pedro, for your excellent introduction to uh, analog neutral atom computing. Um, it's, I, I, you know, it is a different paradigm than what I think a lot of you might be used to, but I think it uh, makes it a lot more interesting. So uh, because we have a unique platform, we have our own version of programming, and that version of programming our device is called Blockade. So in this tutorial, um, I'm going to go through it relatively quick because we don't have a ton of time, but uh, basically you can break down the computation into uh, kind of two basic steps. So the first step is you want to define what your geometry is. Um, and we have a lot of different features available to you for actually building your geometries and visualizing it, which I will show you. Uh, and then the second half is actually building your waveforms. So those, the detuning, the Robbie phase, the Robbie amplitude, uh, those are going to be key components of your algorithm. Um, so, okay, if you go through this notebook, which you'll see tomorrow, it'll be provided in the Cubrate uh, materials. Uh, we'll have, like, again, a um, introduction to uh, analog computing with all of the uh, Hamiltonian details and all of its glory. And of course, you'll have lots of wonderful helpers from Quera to help you understand what all these formulas mean if you're not familiar with this notation. Um, so first, let's just give you a tour of the different kinds of functionality you'll be using in Blockade. Um, so there's there's actually, it's actually quite deep what you can do with the platform, but I'm just going to kind of show you this uh, surface level details and we can chat one on one if you uh, decide to take our um, challenge. But the main thing that you're going to want to work with is this function that you can import from blockade uh, it's called Rydberg H. So this will basically package everything together into one program, which you can then submit online to uh, Aquila or run locally on your laptop. Um, so in order to actually build the different components, we need to import uh, these functions that are helpful for building the piecewise linear and piecewise constant protocols, which you'll need to use for your uh, hardware programs. Now, there are more advanced features which allow you to program with continuous waveforms and then discretize those to make them fit on your on Aquila on our device. Um, but at least when you're first getting started, I find it helpful to work with explicitly uh, waveforms that are native to the platform. So in this case, we provide helper functions to build those in a very easy way. Um, and then, yeah, there's some other utilities here, which I probably won't talk about, but uh, the, other, the other important thing is this load and save. So there's lots of objects inside a blockade, which allow you to serialize them to JSON. And this will be important for, let's say, storing your data that you get uh, and storing job information. So when I submit a task to uh, Aquila, I'll actually have to submit this thing through Braquette, through a, a web API, and you're going to get a, an ID back for every single task that you put in. And for tomorrow's challenge, you're only going to get five tasks with 100, 50 tasks? 50 tasks. Oh, 50 tasks, sorry. 50 tasks with 100 shots each. So you know, these are very precious resources. So every time you submit a task, you want to make sure that you save those results. Like you basically you want to submit and then you want to save it to a file. Uh, at least that's my recommendation. In Just, emulation, you can do as much as you want, but after a submission, 50 tests under shots. Yes, exactly. So yeah, that, that's important. So you can do as much as you want with uh, your, your emulator. Um, you can also save emulator results locally if you want. That's, uh, but you know, those are not as precious as your pre uh, hardware tasks that you submit. Um, so yeah, just really wanna emphasize how important it is to save those results. Okay, so how do I actually build geometries? Well, I mean, the basic, the basic geometry uh, we have is basically just a list of coordinates. So I say, put atoms in these 10, whatever, 10 locations, uh, and so, it's it's just called list of locations. Okay, so it's really simple. Uh, if I want a list of locations. I create a list of locations. But we also have a, a predefined set of um, kind of your standard two-dimensional Brave lattices. So uh, we have a Lieb lattice, square lattice, a chain, honeycomb, blah blah blah. The list goes on. 
So uh, if you want to build something like the uh, square lattice, let's say, um, what I can do is I just give it the, you know, the number of unit cells along one uh, direction, the number of unit cells on the other direction, and then the lattice spacing, uh, which is just a number to tell you how far away each, uh, how big the unit cell needs to be. Um, so yeah, you build your geometries and you hit show. Uh, if you use this, um, if you initialize your notebook with this uh, bokeh notebook function, you'll see these plots actually get rendered in your Jupyter notebook. And they're pretty neat, they're interactive. So I can actually look at them and get, get the index, get the location, uh, some useful stuff. Okay, so now we wanna build our waveform. So if you've done the work, you've defined your geometry, you kind of know exactly what you'd like to simulate. So now we wanna define the waveforms that we'd like to do. So uh, piecewise linear, the way we've uh, defined the API the, for the piecewise linear is you define the segments lengths first. So for example, these, uh, the elements of this list are basically the duration of the first segment, the duration of the second segment, the duration of the third segment, and so on and so forth. And this is a little bit easier because a lot of times you kind of know what duration you want and you don't necessarily want to like have to do the cumulative sum to figure out how far along in time you are. So basically you define the durations and then this next list basically tells you the positions of the points. So every pair of points corresponds to a segment in this graph. So in this case, uh, I've got a duration of 0.2 and it goes from minus four to zero. So, oh, minus four to minus four. Yeah, sorry. It's a little hard to read because there's no spaces. Pedro, come on now. <laughs> Gotta put the spaces in there. Okay, minus four to minus four. Okay, so obviously that segment's gonna be flat with a duration of two microseconds. Uh, sorry, so the units are in microseconds and the units for the Y positions depend on the field that you're looking at. So for detuning and for uh, the Rabi amplitude, so omega and delta, the units are going to be um, radians per microsecond, yeah. which you can convert to megahertz by just dividing by two pi. So everything in the note, uh, blockade will expect you to multiply everything by the two pi. Um, I personally just deal with the, the units as, as they are. Um, so this is also a convention for if you're if you're familiar with the Brockett SDK, uh, you know, they also have the same convention for units. Oh no, wait, no, they use SI units. SI units are even worse. So you know, <laughs> we can at least all agree on that for this this problem. So yeah, you define your durations, you define your values, and then you plug them into your function, and you get a waveform. Uh, and this waveform again has a show method. The show method will give you an interactive plot. You can see, ooh, look, I can see the X and Y position as I scroll across the screen. Very lovely. There's also some things to zoom in and pan the graph around if you want. Uh, so very cool. Um, so this is our detuning waveform, I guess. Uh, yeah, uh, waveform one, sorry. We don't know what this is. Uh, this is also another version of this piecewise linear with less segments. Um, this, this, you'll see this quite a bit in a lot of the examples that we have, uh, this trapezoidal shape. Um, there's actually kind of a reason for this, but we'll let you guys actually try and understand why we pick a trapezoid as our shape for the Rabi amplitude. And maybe you'll figure out something uh, else that we don't understand. Uh, finally, uh, the important thing, so the phase actually has to be piecewise constant. And there's, a, there's actually a pretty good reason for that that's hardware related, uh, which we can talk about if you're interested. But suffice to say, when you submit your programs to Aquila and you do not have a piecewise constant waveform for the phase, it's going to yell at you and uh, say, you're not doing uh, what you should do. So just keep that in mind for uh, job submission. All right, so we've defined our three waveforms, uh, waveform one, waveform two, and waveform const. Uh, so now we can make our uh, Rydberg Hamiltonian. So we're gonna ignore all the waveforms that we just made because this is just a demo. Uh, so a standard program, we're going to, oh, does anyone have a question? Sorry, if I'm going a little too fast, just shout. Okay. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start out with a square lattice and square lattices are very interesting. They're nice. They represent a lot of like materials that you might wanna study. But another interesting thing we study in uh, these, uh, um, this platform is 
uh, disordered lattices, so non-regular geometries. And so one thing we can do is we can create a square lattice, and then we created a handy uh, method of the square lattice called apply defect density. And what this will do is it will just take random sites. You can give it a random number generator if you want so that you get the same results every time. Uh, but it will just randomly pick out uh, with probability uh, 0.03 whether or not that site should live in the graph. Um, and so after applying this, uh, we should trim all the vacant sites from this graph. So basically, like uh, actually one of the features of our devices, you can have empty sites inside of our our lattice. You can request to not have an atom at a site. Uh, but generally speaking, I would uh, recommend using um, only the sites that you plan to use. There's, there's like kind of specific reasons for noise and other things that make it better to remove those sites. Um, so that's basically going to be our geometry. So uh, from there, we can define our durations. Uh, in this case, we're going to share the durations amongst the detuning and the Rabi amplitude waveforms. Um, so in this case, we have 0.15 microseconds. So we're kind of, this is maxing out the time of our, our pulse sequence. So this is going to be our kind of adiabatic sweep. Uh, and then we define the values of our detuning um, following the examples from before. We make our waveforms. And then we just package everything up into this function. Uh, and this will give you a program. So this program now is actually all set to run. Um, and if you want to access some of the visualizations, again, you can actually do this by calling these parse functions. So parse, re parse register and parse sequence uh, give you some information about the register being the atom geometry and the sequence being uh, all of the waveforms that you're actually applying as a function of time. So this is your register. So this is our disordered square lattice. And then uh, our sequence is basically just two waveforms. Um, we have our detuning and we have our Rabi frequency amplitude. Uh, you see I have two graphs happening in parallel, so you can kind of visualize what's going on with your graphs. Um, and so now uh, what we can do is we can actually run this on the uh, blockade on our emulator. So the syntax that you would want to use to submit this or run this program is you follow the first uh, program dots and there's going to be a property which will correspond to which service you would like to choose. So in this case, we're using the blockade service. Um, but if you want to submit to hardware, you'd actually choose a different uh, branch in this which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, the next is the back end. So there's a, in this case, Blockade has a Python emulator that will come ship with your um, uh, package when you install it. And then in the future, we're hoping to actually put, provide a Julia back end. So you'll be able to actually submit tasks from Python into a high performance Julia emulator. Uh, and then after that, you do run. And so run has a lot of options based on what kind of back end you're picking. Uh, in this case, we're just going to show you the shots. And this interaction picture, um, which is a, basically a way of um, switching from, well, it's a little complicated, but it's, it helps you deal with a lot of the issues that you get when you have atoms that are really close together. So if you find that your solver is having problems, uh, a lot of times if you turn on this interaction picture equals true, that can help you uh, get better performance and um, resolve any issues with the solver. And of course, you know, we'll have lots of people walking around yesterday, or. Uh, tomorrow, and we can uh, help you out if you have any issues. Uh, so now that we've got a result, I, when I run this, I will get a output. Um, and this output ha basically will contain a bunch of different information about your task. Um, so when you actually submit this to uh, Aquila on the cloud, you're going to get an object that will contain the IDs of your tasks that you submitted. And then through calling uh, some methods of this output, you'll be able to fetch those results from the cloud uh, automatically. In this case, we don't have to fetch from the cloud all the objects, all the data is stored locally. Um, so the, the most convenient thing to use is this uh, output.report, and this will have some helper functions which will process the data for you. So when I call uh, report.bitstrings, this will actually go through and uh, remove any uh, runs, any shots that have a defect in them. 
So remember how Pedro talked about how you have this initial configuration of atoms that gets sorted into place. Uh, sometimes the, the sorting is not perfect and you'll get uh, defects in that sorting pattern. So by default, Blockade will filter out those shots that have a defect in them. So you're getting basically data that is clean. Uh, there's no defects in it on top of what um, you requested. Uh, and then it will just give you the bit string. So basically zero being the uh, Rydberg state and one being the ground state. Um, another, uh, another important thing is this counts. So it will basically take that bit string uh, array and just collapse it into a dictionary, uh, kind of like a histogram. So you've got like, this is the bit string and this is the counts based on the number of shots that you get. So that, that could be useful if you want to visualize things as a histogram uh, versus just doing some uh, calculation with NumPy arrays. Um, and finally, there's this rig word density, which basically does the average for every single Rydberg atom. Um, and it just spits out a list. So you can see here, okay, the, this uh, qubit zero has a very low uh, Rydberg density. Yes? Yes. So you set it up, you put the waveforms in, you wait the time of the duration of the waveforms, and then you measure yep. all qubits at the same time. Yep, exactly. Yep. So you get like, yeah, you basically, every single shot is a, is a string of bits, uh, zero being uh, the Rydberg state and one being the ground state. And that's actually an artifact of how the measurements actually happen. We literally go in and view them and, and image them with a camera. And bright spots are the atoms that are in the ground state, and dark spots are atoms that are in the Rydberg state. So that's why the, the zero and one is flipped. It's actually just an artifact of how we uh, do the uh, measurements. OK, so uh, this report object also has a nice interactive view. So you can see basically um, the probability here, and you can visualize which, what is the configuration of your shots for that particular um, uh, that particular part of the histogram. And then this left hand's, uh, the, sorry, this rightmost plot is the average uh, Rydberg density now. So you see they're kind of like flipped. Okay. So uh, submitting jobs on the hardware is basically as easy as running the emulator. Um, the only difference is what you actually select. So you select Brockhat as your service now. Uh, Brockhat also has a local emulator, but to be honest, it's much slower than blockades emulator so you know use it if you want but um uh, we we like to make it a little bit faster <laughs> so broadcat uh is the service uh you can use aquila which is our device and then run a sync now is the command that you do so why run a sync well you don't uh, if you click run what will what will happen is basically blockade's going to wait it's going to wait and it's going to wait and it's going to wait it's going to wait for the results results to come back from the qpu so in order to avoid having to wait uh, for your jobs to finish you call run async and this will basically give you back the results immediate uh, give you back a future object so something that contains the information that you would need to retrieve your data once the job is completed um, so in this case immediately after that you can call fetch so what fetch will do is this is what's going to wait and wait and wait and wait um, but if you don't want to wait you can just dump this to a json file and then it will live on your computer and you can unfreeze it later from json and uh, call fetch again and this will allow you to um, dynamically save data and then fetch it later on when you actually have the results back and you want to do the analysis now, Cubraid has a lot of nice features that allow you to track your job. I was going to ask, since you're using Bracket, is there also like a Bracket dashboard that you can access through where like jobs can store something like that? Yeah, so Cubraid actually, you'll be using Cubraid, you'll be using Bracket through Cubraid. So Cubraid has a dashboard. Um, the reason why we designed it this way was that a lot of times you would like to do some uh, group of tasks, a parameter scan, let's say. I want to like, measure the system at a bunch of different points or like I'm running a series of experiments that are all related to one another. So uh, the, the framework allows you to batch all of those jobs and store them in one thing. So you don't have to keep track of like, you know, I'm running a hundred different parameters in my, in my job. Uh, 
you know, it's annoying to have to deal with a hundred different things simultaneously. So we keep everything packaged together into one thing. Although I would say for most of what you guys will be doing, you probably won't need to do too many of these parameter scans anyways. But so this, this will probably do everything that you'll need to do uh, very easily. Okay, uh, so I can save, I can save this and then I can load it later on um, just by referencing the file name. Perfect. Uh, and then I can recover the results. So in this case, um, I call the report show and everything's exactly the same. I can do the same analysis uh, from emulation as I would do for hardware. Uh, so you don't, your workflow is really kind of like fixed by this, um, uh, the, the interface. Uh, yeah, so that's basically it. Yes. So on the hardware, you can get to much larger system sizes. So for example, like blockade, like the emulator, you probably would be pushing it if you were running it on your laptop to go more than like 20 qubits. Yeah, max, max, like you'll be waiting for a long time. So I think the, the point is that for running hardware, you can actually do realistically uh, really big systems and you can actually you know, start to get towards like actual interesting problems. I think we never said, right? Aqualock can run up to 256 atoms. Okay, so it all depends on that 75 by 76 micrometers. If your geometry, like if it was 1D, you can fit it, right? Right, if yeah. To the geometries, you can fit up to like more than 100 atoms and uh, you will not do simulation of that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Even with state-of-the-art methods, it's, yeah. Yeah. I didn't notice at this time, is, um, the waveform is, it, it hits all of the uh, atoms at the same time. Yeah. So you can't say this one hits this one and that one hits that one. Not yet. Nope. Right. Okay. But notice that the geometry, right, the VIGA, because that depends on geometry, mm -hmm. things are not just uniform. Right. Yeah. It's not so simple. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can get some interesting things. Like, if you even just go to the blockade plot, right, you can see, like, why is this configuration the most probable, right? If it was uniform, it would kind of be a more of a uh, flat distribution. So, so for, for information, these jobs, the jobs that you'll be sending to Aquila, they're going to be running through the public queue on AWS. So, I don't expect anybody suddenly coming and say, oh, I'm going to submit a 24 hour jobs. <laughs> um, 50 tasks of 100 shots each, they should take no time. So whenever you submit something, you will, you will more or less be receiving the data back uh, more or less in real time or as fast as the, the shots come. Okay, so that's, that's the expectation. But uh, make sure that you do plenty of emulation before you do uh, job submission because you, you, you don't want to waste it, right? You want to make sure that you run what you need to run to make the best case for, for the referees in the end. Yeah. If you use the more advanced features of Blockade, actually that, that process of going from emulation to uh, refining it and going to the uh, hardware is like really simple because uh, if you use the full power of it, you can actually parameterize your pulse sequences. You can define a, an, a, like a basically fully arbitrary program that you can control the points. And then like, once you've kind of decided what those parameters can be, you can assign them and then submit it to hardware. So it really kind of like the experience is like super, super oriented towards using our, our hardware. You learn a lot, but I think that we should we need stop to, right now need because to you need out, yeah. to have some moments to discuss and form teams, et cetera. So we're gonna wrap up for now, but we're looking very much forward to seeing you tomorrow. And there's gonna be more different software programming paradigms We'll be sharing through the day. Uh, we're gonna have fun together. So yep. good luck. Thanks,